A few quick uh, observations about Papua New Guinea politics then. Uh, at independence, as, as many of you will, uh, will recall, there were predictions of, of a total collapse once the Australians uh, went out. I mean, what, what could happen? We'd looked at uh, decolonisation in Africa and Asia. Military coups had uh, occurred in, in the majority of countries. Uh, people who had been watching Papua New Guinea quite closely, even people like the journalist Peter Hastings and uh, academics like uh, Hank Nelson, were saying it was quite likely there'd be a military coup. In fact, uh, Peter Hastings at one stage said a military coup is inevitable, given the cohesion of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force and the lack of cohesion in any other political institutions. Uh, the truth was that uh, Papua New Guinea survived that early period fairly well uh, and remains with the possible qualification from what's been going on in the last few months, remains one of the few post-colonial states that has maintained an unbroken record of democracy. And I think we need to, to bear that in mind. That said, uh, the country does have a reputation for political stability. Uh, and the reasons for that are that um, although elections have been held on time and all changes of government have been, uh, have been by constitutional means, all the governments uh, since before independence, in fact, have been coalitions. Uh, governments have changed in every parliament, uh, bar the 2002-2007 parliament, mostly as a result of votes of no confidence against the Prime Minister. Uh, and there have been frequent shifts uh, in uh, cabinet composition and shifts in parties. Um, when I say governments have been by coalitions, I'm not just talking about two or three party coalitions. In 2002, the, governing, the initial governing coalition was uh, a coalition of 13 parties. And in 2007, the, coalition, the governing coalition was initially 14 parties, although that diminished a little bit. Um, elections themselves have been fiercely contested. The number of candidates has increased steadily from, from memory about 500 in 1977 up to 2,800 in 2007. That plateaued out a little bit, it actually turned down uh, slightly and we thought maybe we had reached the plateau. But in 2012, depending on which figures you accept, we had either 3,435 candidates or 3,428 candidates, but we had a hell of a lot of candidates. The average number of candidates went up from 2007 uh, to in to 2012 from 25 to 32. And when we're talking about 32 candidates, uh, again, we need to remind ourselves we're not talking about a few, one or two or three or four candidates who've got a good chance of getting elected and a lot who haven't. We're talking about fields in many cases in which any of a dozen or more candidates have got a reasonable chance of getting elected uh, if they can hold the block together. Parties have been weak. Um, parties have tended to uh, proliferate before elections, uh, often amalgamate after elections. The ones who don't get candidates up often just disappear completely. Um, the parties are not sharply differentiated from one another. We don't have the sort of major social cleavages in Papua New Guinea that have divided parties in, in Western societies along class or religious lines, not even along ethnic lines in Papua New Guinea. Um, so parties are not very differentiated. Uh, elections tend to be fought on very much local issues and local personal followings. I've argued elsewhere that if you look at the winning candidates, they generally have a fairly broad spread uh, of votes across the electorate. We've done analyses of ballot box figures. Um, but a lot of the other candidates get all their support from their own clan group or their own local group. And the winning candidates really need to be able to hold their own clan group or their own local group together if they're really going to have a good chance of, of being elected. Um, there has been a high turnover of MPs in every election. In every election to date, it's been more than 50%. In, 19, uh, sorry, in 2002, it got up to about 80%. Um, so politicians who are seeking election and generally spending a lot of money to get elected want to get a return on their investment if they get into, into parliament. Uh, and that accounts for part of the competitiveness of elections. Particularly in the Highlands, uh, elections have been marked by a fairly high degree of electoral fraud uh, and a good deal of violence. Uh, we've had uh, ongoing problems of getting roles together, getting a role together or to even taking a census is very different, very difficult in a country like Papua New Guinea, particularly once uh, you get out into remote areas where the 
mandate of the electoral commission, uh, let alone the mandate of the government, is, is often hard to maintain. So we have problems at that level, uh, and we, we have difficulties in, in even assigning candidates to parties. This is relevant now because what's going to happen next is that as all the uh, results are declared, the leader of the party with the largest number of endorsed candidates elected will be invited to form a government. One of the problems that's emerging at the moment uh, is determining what parties candidates belong to. They're supposed to put in their party on their nomination form, and they generally do, but they don't always. Uh, the Registrar for Political Parties is supposed to receive a list from every party of their endorsed candidates, and he generally does get that. Uh, those two lists don't necessarily coincide, and sometimes people will come along and change their minds. So we've got a period now where with uh, coalitions being put together, a lot of politicians are currently talking about changing party already. Uh, and it's not exactly clear what the, uh, the implications of the legislation are. It seems to me fairly clear, and it's, uh, it's the electoral commissioner will determine which party people belong to, generally based on their nomination form. Uh, but this is emerging as a possible issue, and we could see some argument around that issue in the next, in the next few days. Okay, once uh, MPs get into Parliament, what we've seen in the past has been a great deal of what's called party hopping. Uh, party, uh, individual members will jump from one party to another, uh, generally depending on what sort of an offer they can be made from, a, from another party. And parties have tended to shift from one coalition to another. Uh, so we've had a constant shift within Parliament of both members and parties. Uh, and votes of no confidence uh, against Prime Minister, sitting Prime Minister. So as I say, most of the changes of government that have occurred mid-term have been as a result of votes of no confidence against the Prime Minister. In 2001, uh, we had a piece of legislation come in, the Organic Law on the Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates, which gets abbreviated to OLIPAC. The requirement of an Organic Law on the Integrity of Political Parties and Candidates was included in the Constitution in 1974 in 1975, but it wasn't in fact until 2000 that the legislation got to Parliament. Twice there was an attempt to introduce an organic law and it didn't get through Parliament. Most of the sitting members saw very little gain to be had from introducing uh, such a law and uh, stipulating integrity of political parties and candidates. <coughs> uh, but after a change of government uh, in which uh, Sir McCary Morata replaced uh, Bill Skate, an attempt was made to bring in reforms both economic and political and the OLIPAC was brought in as part of that, uh, that package. It was then expected, uh, well, I, I should elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, part of the provision of the organic law was that political parties must be registered with a registrar for political parties. There was, in fact, a registrar for political parties already with the Electoral Commission, but I think people had kind of forgotten that, and uh, an independent registrar was set up with his own commission. The parties registered with the registrar were to get public funding based on the number of MPs they got elected to the House. And individual members had strong disincentives to shift from parties. If they shifted from one party to another, uh, they had to appear before the Ombudsman Commission and justify uh, why this was done. They ran the risk of being uh, accused of um, of an unauthorised change in parties, which meant that the, at least they had to refund campaign expenses provided by the party that endorsed them. At worst, they lost their seat. In 2003, there was a major uh, dispute over policies in Parliament. Sir Michael Samari attempted to uh, extend the grace period in which votes of no confidence could not be brought in. His coalition split on this. All the major parties split on this. Uh, so we had parties on the opposition and the government. We had disputes over who was the party leader. We had the registrar for political parties making rulings as to who was the party leader. We had the Speaker of the House making rulings on who was the party leader. And in some cases, we had court cases. And these decisions didn't necessarily coincide. Most of us thought that when this had happened, we would see the OLIPAC come in, the operation of the law would then sort out this uh, situation and we'd strengthen the parties back again. That didn't happen. Uh, one of the problems was that the, the law requires that all party members follow resolutions of their party. Transpired in many cases, the parties had never bothered to make a resolution. They just expected people to follow who they thought was the leader at the time. Um, so. Throughout the 2000, 2000, uh, 2002 to 2007 Parliament, 
We had party split, we had people going from one side of the house to the other. We had moves for a vote of no confidence against the government, and these were generally averted by the Prime Minister and his compliance speaker adjourning the House for months at a time. So for three years in a row, the Parliament did not meet the mandated 63 parliamentary days a year in which Parliament was supposed to meet. This, uh, the, the Speaker played a major role in this. He was known to, uh, to take a, a, a vote of the House on voices only and refused to actually count the hands. Uh, and uh, the proceedings of Parliament were pretty much managed to, to advantage the government of the day. Notwithstanding all that, between 2002 and 2007, the Somari government became the first government in Papua New Guinea to survive a full term in office. And I'd argue, as I have, I think, that this was less due to the provisions of the OLIPAC than to the way in which the Somari government used its majority to uh, push its will onto, onto Parliament. I might also say that within the Somari government there was what was known as an inner cabinet and a lot of people on the outer fringes of, uh, of the government felt that uh, they were being pushed around a bit. So there were at that stage a lot of tensions. Notwithstanding that in 2007 Somari was re-elected as Prime Minister. His National Alliance again won the largest number of seats and pretty much the same behaviour continued. Uh, in March 2000, and, uh, well, I should say before that, in 2009, mid-year 2009, uh, there was another attempt uh, to bring in a vote of no confidence, and once again, uh, this was uh, this was pushed off by adjourning Parliament, uh, an act which uh, the post Courier uh, editorial described as a shameless uh, exercise in self-preservation and it resulted in 11 members of the coalition crossing the floor. We then move into the second phase of this, the, the events of August 2nd uh, last year and the, the uh, events which followed that. In July 2010, a decision came from the Supreme Court in response to a challenge to the OLIPAC, which ruled sec se several sections of the OLIPAC unconstitutional. Uh, specifically, these were the sections that uh, required members of parties to vote uh, with their party and required that anybody who had voted for a Prime Minister was bound to support that Prime Minister in any vote of no confidence. You couldn't vote uh, in a vote of no confidence against a Prime Minister you'd voted for. You had to support that Prime Minister in any, in any budgetary vote and any, any uh, vote concerning a constitutional change. The Supreme Court ruled that this was a restriction on the rights of MPs and that provision was ditched. The provision uh, which in, required that members of parties go along with their party on all votes was similarly ditched. So after July 2010, we had the, the, the road cleared to a resumption of what Papua New Guineans generally refer to as yo-yo politics, with people shifting from party to party, parties shifting to, from coalition to coalition. Uh, the vote of no confidence having been avoided, in March 2011, uh, Samari came up before a leadership tribunal uh, for a fairly minor charge. He had not put in the necessary uh, re uh, statements to the Ombudsman Commission about his uh, financial affairs. Uh, he was given a, a short suspension uh, and then resumed uh, office after that. But during that period when he was suspended, Samari took the rather unusual step, I think, of not letting the Deputy Prime Minister be the Acting Prime Minister, but sacking the Deputy Prime Minister of the time, Don Pollier, and replacing him by another member of his National Alliance Party. Uh, awkwardly, uh, a member from the same province as Don Pollier. Uh, Pollier was obviously pretty pissed off about this, but at the time was quite gracious and, and said he went along and accepted the, uh, the Prime Minister's ruling on this. But tensions were building, not only within the coalition as a whole, but within the National Alliance. Then, of course, uh, as you all recall, Samari went off to Singapore at the end of March um, for medical attention, and in, in June was still there. Uh, his son actually said that the family had decided that he should retire, uh, though apparently Sir Michael hadn't been consulted at this stage and he came back to Papua New Guinea in July saying he hadn't retired. Yes. Nama particularly, and to a certain extent O'Neill, was saying, well, yeah, the election's coming up and a lot of people saw the election as resolving this impasse, 
But let's postpone the elections. The electoral rolls aren't proper and we're not ready for the election, so let's postpone it. And we all kept saying we will have the election uh, in uh, June. Uh, Nama was adamant that, we, that, that there wouldn't be, and, and in O'Neill's absence at one stage, he declared a state of emergency under which uh, it looked quite likely that he was going to postpone the elections <coughs> in a state of emergency. Uh, but by that stage, the Electoral Commissioner, which of course is an independent position, the Electoral Commissioner being saying, we're going ahead with the elections. And by that stage, some 3,500 people had paid their nomination fee about their campaigning, and there was nothing was going to stop an election taking place in June. And that's the election we've just had. Okay, so the election, uh, the voting started on the 23rd of June uh, with this uh, 3,545 candidates. 46 parties were registered with the um, Registrar of Political Parties. Now, interestingly, for reasons that are not clear to any of us, only 22 of those parties endorsed candidates. A couple of quite large parties, including the People's Action Party, who had been a major coalition party in the Somali government, did not endorse any candidates. Um, we're still not quite sure why that happened. Uh, but still, there were enough parties to go around, even for those who didn't nominate. Uh, and a large number of independents, as usual. Um, of those 3,000 odd candidates, there was a record number, but still a quite small number, of 136 women candidates, after a lot of effort had been put into uh, trying to foster women's participation in the election. But there was nonetheless a feeling that uh, in the next parliament it was quite likely that there'd be no women. Um, Carol Kiddu, uh, who had been the one member in the parliament from 2007 to 2012, had announced she would retire, and there was no obvious candidate around who looked likely to uh, augment the, the women's numbers in parliament. There were problems with the roles, as everybody knew, and as I've said, it's very difficult to get roles together. Um, in, back in 2002, many of the roles in, in provinces were twice the number of people who are estimated to be in that age group. Uh, and I've seen roles from parts of the country where the same name uh, occurred six or seven times, uh, sometimes uh, with slight variations. The, the advisors to the, the, to the Electoral Commission pointed out they had computer programs that would pick up anything that was duplicated. The logistics are also very difficult, as you all appreciate, Papua New Guinea is a difficult country to get around. Um, in many cases, getting the polling teams out there and the polling materials uh, out in time requires helicopters. Uh, if you're driving through, you run the risk uh, that uh, polling boxes and ballot papers are going to be hijacked on the way, as they regularly are. One less obvious case of fraud, I noticed in, uh, I've been up in East Sepik and uh, in the electorate of Ambunti Drakakia, people were very happy to elect a new member who was actually the son of a former member. Uh, and people were saying, this is very good, you know, with this man's father was the, the member before him, and here's this young man, a young man of 22, who's now going to succeed his father as the member from Ambuti Drakakir. Uh, the problem being that to be a member of parliament, you've got to be aged 25. Uh, so there's a good chance that that election also will be invalidated. Uh, <coughs> as I said, under the ALIPAC, what happens next is that the leader of the party with the most candidates is invited to form a government. It now looks certain that that character will be Peter O'Neill. Uh, I left the figure, the latest reader, print out of figures there, but the Electoral Commission website uh, not only gives you the outcome of the, the election as it comes through, but also gives you the state of the parties and it gives you the number of party members who uh, have been elected.